this time, we light our Christ candle. Perhaps you have one handy word, which, uh, which you'd like to light together with me. This light which reminds us of the light that journeys in and through and with each of us in the love of Christ, lighting our way. Good morning. Please join me for the gathering. From the prophets we hear that when we call on God, God answers. God will be with us in times of trouble, in times of challenge. God will hold us and heal us. God is the one in whom we can find refuge, strength, and courage for the road ahead. Let us open our hearts to welcome God around us, among us, within us. And the opening prayer. O oh, gracious God, in joy and in sorrow, we gather here. We come to you today with our hearts open. You know the ways we are comforted and filled with comfort in these days. And you know the ways we are overwhelmed and our nerves frayed. We come to be healed and to be inspired. We come to be moved by song and held by prayer. We come to be with one another nurtured by each other's presence. We come for the illumination of ancient wisdom and for the revelation of present insight. No matter what, we come. Amen. First reading today is Psalm 123 from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The Supplication for Mercy, a Song of Ascents. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease and of the contempt of the proud. 
The Gospel reading today is from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, again from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The Parable of the Talents For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you have handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us receive what the Spirit is saying to the church. And let us give thanks. So, folks, um... I've only, I've only been part officially of the United Church for about eight years. I was around for a couple more years before uh, completing the membership process. Um, so I'm new here. But uh, in all my moving around over the last eight or ten years with this organization, uh, I've met a lot of amazing people. Um, about five years ago, up in Terrace, um, uh, I was planning a day-long workshop called Being with Grief and Change. It's a topic that could serve some revisiting, of course. Um, For this workshop, for the purpose of of one of the breakout sessions, I engaged the skills of my yoga instructor. Um, And a woman who was going to be attending the event saw the beginnings of the planning materials, uh, was looking over my shoulder and said something like, what a great idea to have a financial advisor in this workshop especially her, she takes the most unique approach. You've never experienced anything like it. And it turns out my yoga instructor also worked as a financial advisor. Now, other than dealing with someone at a bank to set up a student debt situation, I have very little experience with financial planning. Uh, So I was confused. (laughs) Someone with a financial planning background would of course be thoroughly welcome, but I didn't know I'd already enlisted them and their services in this event. And I was very familiar with the reasons why someone who was in the early years of running a yoga studio might need to have more than one job. God knows I had many jobs until 
<laughs> last year, at finally having only one vocational position uh, here at Brecken. But I didn't know why these things would be connected. She explained to me that so often when people have stresses and questions and need to make plans around money, their stresses and questions have deep roots. They're connected to circumstances in the present, but especially in the past, even going back generations. They're influenced by culture and classism and deep emotional things like fear and anger and empathy, which we tender humans aren't always aware of when they're affecting us. And this particular financial planner who would be offering a workshop on yoga in times of grief as part of our day long event was developing a reputation for helping people see how these things were affecting their financial impulses, their perceptions of their needs, their decisions and goals and dreams. So I left that interaction believing that maybe that's what a financial planner does. And actually very, very few people with this training in financial planning actually approach their work this way. I found that out just this spring. <laughs> um, maybe I should actually visit one of these professionals at some point and figure out what they do. But, you know, maybe it's just me. Um, but I sure wish her perspective were a little more widespread. Um, and I can't help but notice the influences of things like culture and classism and intergenerational fears when I hear today's gospel message. Um, once again, as we deal with these finance-based portions of Matthew, I find myself turning to the writings of Debbie Thomas. She sums it up well. Um, and I'm actually going to include a link to her writing that I'm referencing this week because I'm quoting huge chunks of it. Uh, it was a week where I didn't generate a lot of original content. So if you want to read the original article, which I'm quoting heavily, uh, it's in the links there for you now. Debbie Thomas says, the metaphor of God as wealthy slave master doesn't align with the gracious and justice oriented God Jesus describes throughout the gospels. The God who privileges the poor, blesses the meek, frees the prisoner, feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, liberates the slave and protects the orphan. I can't reconcile the God Jesus incarnates among the peasant multitudes with a greedy estate owner who reaps where he doesn't sow and gathers where he doesn't scatter. And I don't recognize the kingdom of God in a story where those who have plenty receive still more. While those who have close to nothing lose even the little they have and then face God's wrath on top of those losses. Debbie Thomas goes on to draw on the work of Amy Jill Levine and William Herzog as she's looking at some of the cultural and historical picture here. She says, first, some context. In Jesus's day, talents were not coins or small bundles of cash. They were hefty, precious metals, usually gold or silver, that weighed somewhere between 80 and 130 pounds. A single talent was worth approximately 20 years of an ordinary laborer's wages. In other words, a talent represented a staggering amount of money to Jesus's peasant audience, an unthinkable lottery jackpot sum that only the wealthiest elite might have to play with. How did the elite amass that kind of wealth? They lent money to the farming poor at exorbitant interest and systematically stripped those debtors of their land. Often the people who took such loans at rates between 60 and 200% did so out of desperation, putting their fields up as collateral in last ditch efforts to save their livelihood. Inevitably, their efforts would fail. Drought would hit or a debtor would grow ill or a crop would yield too little. And could it ever yield enough? At these points, the staggering interest rates a farmer agreed to would kick in and force foreclosure and the poor man would have no choice but to surrender ancestral land Watch as the wealthy elite repurposed these fields for their profit. Join the multitudes of landless day laborers who couldn't know from day to day where their bread would come from. This, Herzog writes, is the situation Jesus describes in the parable of the talents. The three slaves in the story are the wealthy master's retainers or household bureaucrats. 
Essentially, middlemen who oversee the land and the workers collect the debts and keep the profits coming while the master travels on business. It is understood by everyone involved that the slaves are free to make a little extra on the side, you know, where the oppressed becomes the oppressor, charging the farmers additional fees or interest, as long as they keep the money flowing for their master. In this scenario, the slave's status, wealth, and well being are inextricably tied to the masters and to whatever injustice they can stomach levying against their neighbors. The more money they make for him, the better and more comfortable their own lives will become. What happens when we read the parable of the talents through the cultural and economic lend that these academics offer? A member of the wealthy 1% gives three of his most trusted workers a jackpot to play with, gives them the rules. The more they make for the boss, the more they'll get to keep for themselves. The name of the game is exploitation. No questions asked. The only rule is turn a profit. Turn as huge a profit as possible. And two of the slaves do exactly as they're told. They take their talents out into the world and double them on the backs of the poor. Who knows how many fields they seize, how many farmers they impoverish, how many families they affect. It doesn't matter. They fulfill, even exceed the bottom line. When the master returns and sees what they have accomplished on his behalf, he's thrilled. He invites the two enterprising workers to enter into his joy, the joy of further wealth, further profit, further exploitation. But is this the joy of the kingdom? And what does the third slave do? The third slave in the story opts out decides that his master's character is greedy and corrupt, that he no longer wants to participate in dishonest systems of gain, a system based on oppression and injustice. Knowing full well what it will cost him, the slave buries the heavy talent in the earth. He hides it, literally taking it out of circulation, putting it where it will do no further harm to the poor, puts no burden on them or on him. Is it any surprise that a master of this character abuses and banishes a slave of this character when he returns from his journey? In Herzog's words, the slave is more than a quiet hero. He is a whistleblower. At great cost to himself, he names the exploitation, the same exploitation he colluded in and benefited from for some years. He relinquishes his claim on wealth and comfort, calls out the master's greed and rapacity, and accepts the ostracism and poverty that will follow from his choice. Debbie Thomas often speaks of sharing Bible stories with her young son. I think he's about nine or 10 years old. Thomas's son described this parable to his mother as a summation of what Christianity is all about. She's still pondering that possibility, she says. What if her son is onto something? Maybe this isn't a parable about the coming kingdom of God. Maybe this is a parable about the world we occupy right now and how to do kingdom in it. Maybe this is a parable about what faithfulness looks like in hard and hidden and overwhelming places. A parable about our complicity and how it sneaks up on us and the high stakes involved in ending that. A parable about speaking truth to power, about opting out of systems of oppression and exploitation, even and especially when we're accustomed to benefiting from those systems. Interrupting business as usual for the sake of justice and mercy. A parable about turning reality upside down in the name of love. Enough is enough, is what is said when we read the parable this way. When it comes to the abuse and marginalization of the world's most vulnerable people, isn't that what we hope to say? This could be a parable about the rejection and empowerment and loneliness that we might suffer if we take seriously the call of God. 
So then she suggests we ask ourselves, does this work sound too difficult? Does it sound too risky? Does this interpretation of the parable do too much? Provoke too much? Push too hard? And she says, maybe. But consider this, Jesus asks nothing of us that he has not done himself. Just days after telling this parable, we're in chapter 25, remember? Just days later in the Matthew timeline, he was cast into the outer darkness of crucifixion. Like the third slave, he was deemed worthless and expendable by people who had power and influence in his day. And like the third slave's costly talent, he was buried in a rock-hewn tomb. So ooh, with the gift of this interpretation of the scripture, I am left asking, uh, how will we be good stewards of our literal and spiritual resources? How will we ensure our money and our time does less exploiting of others? I look forward to hearing what such a question brings up for each of you, but I can tell you what I've seen in my first year and a bit with Brecken United. I've seen people be extraordinarily generous with skills and energy and time. I've seen people be extraordinarily thoughtful in sharing resources and money. I've seen people be careful in creating uh, and tending to the resources that we hold together as a congregation. That is hard, hard work to hold that common piece. I've seen multiplication as we join together with community groups like Reaching Out Assisting Refugees, Loaves and Fishes. I've seen beauty like what's offered by our music program and our choir. And I've seen examples in all the conversations and all the ideas that have arisen from this community. All the hugs from people like Rhea, who so recently also passed away. Then there's Vera Bell, of course. Eternal blessing now upon her. Every time she said, have I got an opportunity for you? There it was. That was it too. So as we prepare to welcome our transfer of membership folks, I had originally planned on preaching on the new creed. Instead, now there's going to be an article on the new creed on our website uh, shortly here because we had some, some sweet conversations about what that piece has come to mean for each of us as we prepare. But before we go into welcoming our transfers of membership, I'm going to read for us together the new creed. Some of you might even have it memorized. If you do, feel free to speak along. Because in all the resources we share, we hold these and many more deep beliefs and expressions of the kingdom as a community of faith. The new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Now I'm going to need a minute here to set up our screen. I need to pin to our screen those who we are receiving in the process officially of transfer of membership, as well as Ann Manical, Vice Chair of Council, and Kathy Torium, Chair of Council. Um, this is gonna, yeah, this is really gonna take me a minute to find you all on our lovely screens. There's Kathy. Kathy, feel free to unmute yourself. Perhaps you have something to say at this time. 
<sighs> well, we always are so welcoming of new people. And uh, I'm feeling quite emotional because Hero was so special to me. And I know to everyone in our Brecken family, and that's what our Brecken family is all about, is how much we care about one another. find everybody. I'm excited. I'm adding you. And Christina Snow. I've got everyone. So before before we enter this this brief and sweet piece of ritual, um, uh, it bears mentioning. I mean, I talk about. Uh, official membership that I experienced something like eight years ago, I'd have to look it up with the United Church. Um, but I, I just, it, it bears repeating <laughs> that, um, that even if a person um, hasn't endeavored to, to officially join, um, there, there's not sort of like a hierarchy of how welcome a person <laughs> is. <laughs> um, and the, the membership process is really sort of about an opportunity for learning and connection um, uh, for the most part. And that's what I loved about it when I experienced it. So if there's anyone out there who's like, I don't know about membership, that sounds like hierarchy and I don't like those things, um, uh, understandable. Um, but the, the process itself, and I, I love processes, uh, the process itself is, is really sort of um, about a, a learning and a, and a nourishing. Um, in, in who we can be together as a church, um, which you'll, you'll eventually get uh, from, from attending events and services and, and getting to know one another, uh, but taking some time to focus on it can be a true gift. Um, and I'm grateful that I did it, uh, even if I weren't uh, planning on being a minister. So, um, so if, you're, if you're worshiping with us and you're curious about the membership process, um, let's, let's have a conversation. Um, those who we are celebrating with today are folks who have been members existing at other United Churches. Um, and so we, 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 in this moment, celebrate those other communities of faith who have nurtured them and supported them, um, and communities of faith even before that, or communities of non-faith even before that, who, um, who have nurtured you and shaped you and led you to be uh, ultimately uh, at this point here with us at Brecken. And um, before we begin, your certificates uh, are still going to be worked on by Cindy because I didn't get all the information from her. But on behalf of the worship team, we are going to be gifting these fine folks a copy of the Salt of the Earth calendar. Um, I know that I've already promoted this a little bit here and there, but um, it's a calendar which doesn't follow the months beginning in January but follows the liturgical year and it has the readings that I select from for most of our weeks of Sunday mornings um, and beautiful art. And this is something produced by a congregation over in Vancouver. Um, if anyone else wants to pick up a copy, these are available at the office uh, for $13 each. That's enough of that. I invite Anne Manacle to start us off. Our mission statement states, at Brecken United Church, we seek to know the holy mystery as shown to us through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. On our faith journey, we endeavor to make the spiritual development of both and to be a just and loving example of service and discipleship that reaches out to community and all creation. Brecken is an affirming congregation, an affirming ministry, we boldly declare that we fully welcome and include the full participation of all people in the life and work of the ministry as we journey together, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, age, marital status, mental or physical ability, beliefs, cultural backgrounds, or economic circumstance. We are dedicated to being good stewards of God's world, working and living towards justice and holiness for all of God's people. 
every time someone chooses to worship with us even once or attend a Brecon event or officially become a member, they are deeply and wholly welcomed into this way of being as a community and appreciated for all that they are. Today, we celebrate those who are already members of United Churches and are transferring their membership to Brecon. On behalf of Brecon United Church, I present Margie, Christina, John, and Susan, whom we welcome into the membership of this community of faith. Together, I ask all of you, will you join with us as we celebrate God's presence, live with respect in creation, love and serve others, seek justice and resist evil. I will with God's help. Feel free to unmute yourselves and, and share in saying, I will with God's help if, uh, if you're comfortable doing so. I will with God's help. I will with God's help. I will with God's help. And everyone gathered God's here. Today. Help. Wonderful. And everyone gathered here today. Um, this will get a little chaotic, but I invite everyone to unmute yourselves. Do you commit to rejoicing in every member's gifts, offering love and support, and with God's help, continuing to live out the teachings of Jesus and our collective ministry and mission at Brecon United Church? We will. We will. We will. We will. We will. We will. <laughs> Margie, Christina, Susan, and John, may the welcome you receive here today be a reminder of the welcome we have each received in coming here and the welcome we extend to all together. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay. Yay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's share in a beloved hymn together led by the voices of many gathered here. Where have I got it?
I'm going to take a moment to unpin everyone. Let us join together in prayer. Holy One, on this day we gather with joys and sorrows which you already know. You know our hearts. You know the glad lists we carry and you know our grief. Be with us as we gain ever more understanding, ever more depth of being with all that it is to be us in this moment as your people. Be with us in the joys and sorrows that we share now before you in the silence of our hearts. God, for the gifts and talents and generosity and courage and wisdom and beauty of all those gathered here and all those gone before us, we give you thanks. We pray today for Rhea's family as their grief continues in these days after her passing. We pray for Vera's family as they grieve her passing just yesterday. We pray for Nancy's family as her health has affected her at this time as she enters what comes next. And God, we give thanks for what it is to be together as we hold all these, as we hold all that passes in the world around us that which we have some sense of agency over and that which we do not. But together, it becomes just a little bit more possible to face it, to practice the kingdom you call us to. We give thanks for our new official members and all those who have joined us in these recent months for even a half a service, every blessing be on them and every blessing from them in you be known. All this we pray as your son taught us to pray. Our father, our mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, I'm Blaine. What is stewardship? What does it actually mean? Wikipedia explains it this way. Stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources. The concepts of stewardship can be applied to the environment and nature, economics, health, property, information, theology, cultural resources, etc. With God's help, we can apply the concept of good stewardship in various ways. Some of these are quite familiar, like taking care with our offering to properly fund the church, our incredible staff, and our regular monthly overhead. 
as well, we are familiar with the stewardship of the environment. We're reminded of this, for example, every time we say or hear the acknowledgement that we're gathering on the ancestral lands of the Snunemo people and that we share with them the sacred trust to be good stewards of the land. However, there may be stewardship that we're routinely ignoring. For example, in this pandemic, we may be forgetting to be good stewards of ourselves. It's easy to ignore ourselves in our deep concern for those around us. So I'd like all of you to do something with me right now. I'd like you to lift up one hand and one arm and I'd like you to reach around and give yourself a good pat on the back. We'd like to hear you say, I'm vowing to be a good steward of myself. I'm vowing to be a good steward of myself. So give yourself a pat on the back, be glad for your life, be glad for your blessings. When you acknowledge stewardship of self, then you can be a confident and committed steward of God's wonderful world. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you call us to respond to your love with love. Accept these gifts we bring so that together we may be able to show your love and transform the lives of your people. Lord, we pray you will guide us on our mission of stewardship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Mission and Service Fund, generously supported by the people of the United Church, works with partners offering hope in Canada and in parts of the world. We thank you so much for your continued support. So folks, as you go from here invited into living parables of interrupting business as usual for the sake of justice and mercy. Know that you are held in love, that the light goes with you. to discontinue our recording and invite those who are here with us in person on Sunday morning to share in a time of fellowship. Be well, folks.